Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 642nd episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we've got a young stud, Adam Rosen, getting into sharing how to reach decision makers today. And, um, you know, cold outreach, man, it's been blowing up. Uh, I'm about to dip my toe into it. Uh, I've got a couple of clients that are already doing it, so I'm helping them optimize it. Uh, I may do it for myself. Uh, a business partner of mine is doing it for himself, reaching out to attorneys. Um, I've had a little bit of success helping attorneys. He's had some success. So we shall see. But um, I'm still, I mean, I'm a little bit on the fence about it. Um, you know, one guy's like, well, you're you're reaching out. You know, you might as well get found. You might as well do what's working. I'm like, yeah, maybe. Um there are, I feel like there's still some gimmicks around it, um, but uh, there are viable companies that offer this. Uh, there are big viable companies that leverage this type of uh, outreach. So there's something to it um, if you are considering it because, you know, it's hard to reach people now. Uh, it's hard to reach decision makers, especially at bigger companies. Uh, so you may have to get creative. Okay. Um, Adam's a good dude, um, living life on his terms, you know? So, um, even if you don't want to do cold outreach uh, like he does, you can learn from, um, his mindset, how he's planning, how he's growing, um, how he's living life on his terms. All right. Um, you've heard me talk about the inner circle. Um, I've, I've redirecting one of my URLs just to make it simple, westmethod.com, westmethod.com. Uh, go check out the worst landing page you'll probably ever read. But I think I like it, and I'll explain why in the inner circle. So uh, check that out, westmethod.com, and uh, let me help you for a long time, uh, very affordably, to grow your sales. All right, it's ideal for... Um, W2 salespeople, B2B salespeople, um, sales leaders, um, entrepreneurs, um, owners, founders of small businesses, and like, technically probably the micro businesses uh, for that, uh, for the inner circle. Um, you know, work with owners, 90, 100 employees, uh, the inner circle is probably not a fit for those guys. <coughs> Man, I still got this cough. 100, over 100 days. Unbelievable. But, uh, uh, you know, the private work is more for companies that size. You know, if you've got two, three, five employees, 10 employees, then the, the inner circle can be for you. All right, westmethod.com. Check that out. And then come back and listen to this episode with Adam. Adam Rosen, world traveler. Uh, are you a man without a home? Well, and, you know, whatever, man. All the way from Hawaii at this moment. Founder of the Email Outreach Company. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? Doing great, man. I, I appreciate you having me on, Wes. I'm excited to be here. So what's the deal, man? You, you can't stand still? Why, why are you traveling the world? And why'd you do it during COVID? What the heck, man? Are you crazy? Yeah, I uh, in my previous life, I was the complete opposite. So like, I really don't like the term digital nomad. But my previous life, when I started my first tech company coming out of college, I was the opposite. I thought the only way to build a successful company is you got to live in the office. And that's what I did. You know, literally, I, I'm not saying this for any pat in the back because I actually don't think it's necessarily even a good thing. But I was a Monday, Sunday type of guy, Monday through Saturdays, oftentimes 6 a.m. in the office till 7, 8 p.m. at night. Uh, I love when, I, when people say p.m. at night, kind of goes hand in hand, but uh, to 7 p.m., <laughs> 8 p.m. Sundays, I take a little bit of a break, more of like a nine to six day. So uh, this, traveling digital nomad lifestyle was the complete opposite of who I was. But at this point, I've been living out of my suitcase for about two and a half years. And at least right now, no, uh, no plan to stop. Nice. So we'll get into your history here in a little bit. Um, you got some newsletters, got some engaged readers, but uh, is there a new, there's something going on with cold email? Because it seems like I am running across that a lot in the last six months to a year it seems to be is it new or i mean i know it's not new right people have already done it but there's some kind of pivot something has happened in the market that it seems to be uh in vogue much more than i've ever seen it 
talk a lot now about the old days of cold email. And I'm not talking about the old days, you know, in 2012 or 2018. I'm talking about the old days in the middle of 2023 when I talk about cold email, because like you said, Wes, really in the last nine months, especially the cold email world got flipped on its head. Part of it was AI. You know, AI was kind of the first thing to start changing the cold email world. But the biggest shakeup happened in September that we saw. And that's when Google Domains was acquired by Squarespace. For example, like overnight, our bounce rate, because for our company, we do cold email outreach for companies where we're sending over a million emails a month. And in September, our bounce rate overnight when that acquisition happened went from about 2% to about 50%. And that forced us to change everything of what we did with cold email to now, as we're recording this in early March, it's a completely different world from what it was, again, even in August of 2023. So those are two reasons. A third reason is some great tools out there, one of which we love is Instantly. Instantly um, is a great cold email tool. But because of how good it is and how easy it is and how cheap it is to get lists and to execute cold email campaigns. It's made it so that it's, again, another startup word I don't like is democratized, but it's democratized the market so much where it's made it so easy for people to join, which has forced places you know, like Google or Yahoo to put up more restrictions to make it so that if you don't do A through Z correctly, you ain't going to go in the inbox anymore. You're going to be landing right in spam. So let's walk through this. What, um, why did the Squarespace acquisition of Google domains change anything? I've seen some acquisitions before, and acquisitions are tough on a small scale. Acquisitions are really tough on a big scale just because there's so much at risk. When Google Domains was bought by Squarespace, there are certain things that you need to do. Think of it like a registration sticker in your car. Things like a DKM, an SPF, a DMARC, all these backend settings to set up your domain properly to basically register you as legitimate sender. When the acquisition happened, much of the, many of those settings got removed. So when they get removed, there's a higher likelihood you end up in spam. So that was the biggest reason. Now things are okay. You can work with Squarespace and you can create your domains through there and it's fine. But because of that, uh, the poor acquisition, a lot of those key registration stickers got removed, which made it so that companies like mine and really anybody who had a domain through there was no longer verified. And then when you tried to contact support to fix it for you, they were like, look, we're inundated. We'll get to this if and when we have a chance, but it's not going to be fixed anytime soon. Okay. So if, if bounce rates are going up like that, why do people do more cold email? Like, what am I, I'm, there's a disconnect there. I'm not following. Well, that was the case. But of course, like for us, there's things you could do to change it, to stop it. So at that point, we just removed all of our domains through there. We created new domains. We created new systems to use. We warmed those up properly. So that's not the case anymore. Uh, But it's more difficult to land in the inbox. So for example, in the old days, again, think 2023 for us. When we would work with a client, we would create one new domain that we would cold email from. Because nobody, I don't care who's listening to this, if you're cold emailing, do not do it from your primary domain. So we would create a new domain and we would create two emails. One email would be our primary email we would send to. A second email was just a backup in case the first one got spammy. Now, when we work with a customer, we're creating five or more domains. We're creating 40 to 100 emails that we're sending from. We're sending 10 emails a day, up to 60 emails a day per inbox. We're doing something called spin tax. So we used to write one good piece of copy and we would run with that as long as it got good results. Now, again, these spam tech filters are getting so good. They'll detect when you're sending mass emails. So we built this GPT through ChatGPT that'll recreate our best emails, but it'll do it in what's called spin tax. So basically, one email we send will get rewritten in 1,000 different variations. So, you know, it'll say, hi, Wes, or Wes, or hello, Wes, and then small changes like that throughout the email. So again, we're hopefully trying to stay ahead of Google's and Yahoo's of the world so that we end up in the inbox. So you just have to take every measure possible. If you do it, cold email still works, but you just can't be an amateur anymore in the cold email world. Yeah. Um. 
what do you say to people that say, all right, cold email, you basically mean spam. So you're a spammer. You want me to spam? Yeah, look, people have uh, – cold email gets a lot of that uh, bad reputation, right? It's kind of like the, you know, the ugly stepchild – you know, from, from the movies back in the day, right? Like people sometimes will have a bad, um, it'll have a bad reputation in some ways. And a lot of it is, is rightfully so. Like we all are sick and tired of getting bad spam emails in our inbox. It sucks, but you know what? We all hate getting bad Instagram ads. We all hate getting bad ads on Google. We all hate bad billboards. Like marketing can be great if it's relevant and, and, uh, uh, promoted well, but marketing can also suck if it's, irrelevant, if it's poor quality, and if it's coming across as spammy. So yes, cold email can be spammy and can be ugly, but if you do it well, it can work and it should work for anybody listening to this. All right. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I see uh, instantly.ai. I see Apollo. Uh, a lot of these things are coming up. I just saw... Um, Oh man, a couple of them. I'm seeing campaigner, I see limb list, I see upticks. I mean, how does somebody pick which one? A lot of them are going to be the same type of quality. So I wouldn't stress out too much about it. Some people will choose it based on cost. The one that we like is instantly. It's low cost. It works well. It's easy to use. They're a great company. Their support is really good. So that's the company we like. But Apollo does a really good job. Just instantly is built more for cold email. Apollo is a little less for cold email. And those are really like the two top dogs in that space. Uh, so what's Apollo built more for? A little more for warmer emails versus, oh, gotcha. you know, uh, uh, instantly is more for like, Hey, you're, you're buying lists through them and you're sending emails through them. It's a little, it's a built a little bit more to cater to cold emailers. Um, so, I mean, are people gaming the system? Cause I mean, I agree with you. There's an old adage, an old ad guy I know, you know, says that, you know, people don't read ads they read what interests them and sometimes it's an ad i think it was ogilvy um so i get it but if i have to buy multiple domains you know sales whisperer dot biz the sales whisperer dot io and then spend email addresses off of that support at you know jws at um, and then spin those, literally spin them to get the message through. Uh, I mean, is that, is that just the game today? Is, is it not any different than retargeting? Yeah. I mean, it's not any different, again, any type of marketing medium. Like for me, I'm not great with social media in terms of like Instagram ads. If you want to do well on Instagram, you have to understand the system. You have to understand, to use your word, Wes, you have to understand the game to do it well. If you want to do a Facebook ad, if you want to do TikTok, if you want to do, shoot, if you want to do a billboard, like there's a game to any marketing medium. It's about figuring out the game. What I've always liked about email is that it's one of the most low cost and direct ways to get in front of your audience. So the costs are not high. It's it's more proactive versus like a Google ad. You're kind of putting it out there and then you're waiting for people to come. And it's also very targeted. So if you for anyone who's a B2B, uh, who's selling into B2B, which I know a lot of your listeners are, <laughs> what I love about it is you could reach out to the VP of HR at companies with a thousand or more employees and send an email just to those people versus putting it on Instagram. And yes, you could target but it still is going to go to a lot of times a random mix of people, some high quality, some low quality. And as long as you're not pulling a bait and switch, you know, telling people you want to talk about one thing and then selling them another thing on the call. When you do have these meetings, they should be a higher quality lead than some of these other marketing meetings. Cause I've done them. Like I've, I've done real estate developments in the past. I would do a lot of Facebook ads and I would get a lot of leads, but most of them were not worth me spending any time on. Um, versus the leads I get on cold, uh, you know, through cold outreach. Not every one of them is great, of course. That's never going to be the case in marketing. But people know what they're getting on the call with you about. So it's a, and you know exactly what their title is. You know why you reached out to them. So as long as you do it right, you should have higher quality leads from it. Well, I've seen, um, you know, really especially since COVID, um, people are hard to reach on the phone, even with direct mail. More people are working from home. Executives. It's hard to get their address. I've seen different companies, things like Sendoso, uh, using various forms of email outreach um, to 
get them to verify who they are, confirm their address. Hey, I want to send you something. Um, I know I got, I'll have a voicemail. It may take me a week to check a voicemail. I hate getting voicemail and I get a ton. Most of the calls I get are spam calls. Um, so, but you know, I am still checking email and even I hate checking email too, but I do it. Um, so are you finding like that's the case? Like uh, executives, like high power C-suite people, uh, are still checking their emails and responding to a good offer. Yeah. We, in my previous startup, we had companies like Bank of America's, we got them as a client, Amazon, Apple, Goldman Sachs, author cold email. And one of the ones I like to talk about is MasterCard. We got MasterCard as a client to go to your point, Wes, from cold emailing. Now their former CEO, Ajay Banga, he's the current president of the World Bank. And from a cold email, he got on multiple phone calls with us, ended up passing us to his CHRO, and they ended up buying. We've gotten multiple calls with uh, billionaires what, from what, cold email. What were, you, what were you selling? So that email is something called uh, uh, what we call an advice email. So it's like, hey, we're young tech founders. This is what we're building. Would you be open to you know, a 10, 15 minute call to give me advice on this? Got on calls. You know, Obviously, he felt it was worth his time, You know, liked us and liked what we were doing. Again, three phone calls with Ajay Banga, you know, probably only 15 to 30 minute calls. But I mean, shoot, think about what, how valuable his time is. And then he found it valuable enough to say, hey, talk to my CHRO. They ended up, again, becoming one of our customers. So cold email, again, what I like about it, what first opened my eyes into cold email was in college, I, I ran this uh, entrepreneur program. I started and ran an entrepreneur program at my school and I wanted Mark Cuban to speak. And I remember cold emailing him and it was a terrible email looking back on it today. And he responded and said, no, he said, no, thanks. That was it. But I was like, shit. I don't know if I could curse in your podcast, but I was like, shit, Mark Cuban just emailed me back. Like, how cool is that? And that's when I started to see, wow, email can get me to how, literally. How do you know it was better. him and, and not an assistant? I guess I don't know it was him. You're right. I can't be certain about that. Uh, but I just felt like Mark Cuban would probably respond with no dot THX. Like, I, I don't know if that's an, I feel like an assistant yeah. probably would have been a little more thoughtful in it, but you're right. I have yeah. no idea. It could have been Mark Cuban's assistant no, that just probably pretended him. to be him. Um, but we, <laughs> the fact that we've gotten on multiple calls with, with again, big time CEOs, like they're not always picking up their calls. I know for me, I have spam blockers on my, on my phone. So like, if it comes from spam, yeah. it's probably not even getting through to me versus email. I do read it. And I, if I'm interested, I'm going to take the call. If I'm not interested, I'm just going to tell the people, Hey, stop reaching out. Um, but again, like with anything, it's about quality. If you do things quality, you have a chance. If you do things at low quality, you're going to piss people off. And we try to stay away from pissing people off. Yeah. So did you just stumble across cold email at the right time? You used it and then saw the value pivoted to, to offering it? Yeah, it was. Look, I never thought I'd run a cold email agency. That's probably the last thing I ever <laughs> wanted to do or thought I would do. It was just, I had a tech startup previously. It was with the same co-founder of this company as I started email outreach company with. And we sold the company in 2019 and we did a million things wrong as a startup. But the one thing we always did a great job of was getting new business. I mentioned some of the big brands we got as customers. We always grew a lot and we didn't grow from any other medium really other than cold email. So when I sold the company, I started to do a lot of work with startups. And as anyone inter anyone listening to this podcast, you know, obviously into sales knows top of the funnel is everything. And there's a million ways to get more top of the funnel, cold email, just being one of those ways. And one of the startups I was advising just said, Hey, Adam, my head of sales is struggling to get meetings on the books. Can you help? I talked to her. I saw there was a big gap with their emailing. I picked up the phone, called my co-founder and said, Hey man, I think we can help these guys out. And uh, we beta tested it with them and a few other startups. It went well. Then nine months after that, after we built out the systems, really proved this thing out, we started to add new customers. And now we're two and a half years in. We've had, at this point, over 60 full service customers. We have a, a mastermind where we train people how to do this. And we're starting to grow into a lot of other mediums now, whether it's LinkedIn outreach, um, doing a lot with newsletters, um, and some other ways to just try to complement the outreach with the whole goal of getting our, pro our customers on as many high quality calls as possible. Yeah. Uh, is there any, is there a sweet spot for cold email, you know, B2B? Uh, like I'm wrapping up my inner circle. 
you know, I want uh, entrepreneurs, W two salespeople, you know, micro business owners, five to ten people, uh, to join uh, the inner circle. Um, would cold email work in that regard? What I love about like for B two B when it comes to cold email is cold email starts with a list. And like what you just described there, Wes, is you could get a list for that where you could target business owners, you know, five to 10 employees. You could target the founder or the CEO. You could target types of companies. So that's what I like about cold email when it comes to B2B is B2B tends to be just you can get higher quality lists. But we've seen it work well, like real estate. We do a lot with real estate. We have some really amazing real estate brands that we work with where they're more direct to consumer. But because their average deal size are kind of similar to B2B and there's ways you can leverage cold email for real estate in a way you would with a traditional B2B type of company. But like for what you described, Wes, cold email would be a great thing for you. Very cool. Um, so you you sold your business in 2019 and what you're doing now, is it with the same co-founder? Same co-founder as that previous company, yes. Okay. Um, and how old is your current company, EOC Works? We started it in uh, middle of 2021. So it's been about two and a half years now. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, and is he doing all the hard work while you gallivant around the world, man? Are you are, are you pulling your weight? I just kind of relaxed on the beach with him most every day and, you know, get, <laughs> get my uh, nice sleep on the beach and, and relax and, and try to build up on my tan as much as I can. All right. So I, I, you need to sell that course. That, that's the course I'll buy. I want to know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I always joke. I say, uh, <laughs> when I tell people at the time, I, I was probably I don't know, 27 years old when I sold my first company, but I always tell people, cause I feel like the startup world is so over glamorized. Um, I had an exit, but it was not the exit. I did move to Hawaii when I sold the company in 2019, but I did not move to Hawaii as a retired 27-year-old living on the beach and relaxing. <laughs> so that was definitely not my acquisition exit. So I, my co-founder and I both actually, we do travel full-time. We're both, you know, that word I don't like, digital nomads, because we do get a ton of inspiration from traveling the world. Um, but for us, career growth is is at the top of the list of importance for us. So we get inspiration from traveling the world, but growing our business is, is still the top priority. How do you decide where you want to go? Well, uh, my co-founder, I typically, like, we kind of did this recently. We'll just look at a map and we'll say, hey, I've always wanted to go there. Let's go there. Um, <laughs> that's a lot of how we'll, we'll do it. So uh, now we, we kind of narrowed down where we really love to be. So we're we're probably a little more specific, but yeah, it's typically just like, hey, let's look at a map of the world. Let's look at Airbnbs and and see if we can find some inspiration there. Nice. So do y'all travel together? For about half the year we do. Um, so we'll be syncing up again in uh, middle of April. We're going to get back together for uh, at least a few months um, before I have to come back to the States for for, for a few weddings that, that I need to be back for. Dude, don't say that to a Hawaiian. Back to the States. They'll get mad. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. So the reason why I said back to the States is because in April, I, I'm leaving the States. I'm going to Italy. That's why I said oh, back to the okay. States. All 100%. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I I'm said actually, that I'm, once yeah. and I've got friends from the Hawaiians and they'll hop your butt. Man, they, they hop my butt. I was like, yeah, good point. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, thank you so much for bringing that up. Because if any of my 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 friends from Hawaii, because I spent a lot, I've probably spent three or four months here every year. If they heard me say that, yes, they would not be happy. But unfortunately, I'm leaving Hawaii in about two weeks to go uh, to the mainland for uh, about a month. And then I'll be leaving the country. So that's why I said coming back to the States. So do you find like a midterm rental? Uh, I mean, I don't think you want to do an Airbnb, do you? Or do they do like better rates for longer term? Yeah, you can always, and I tell people this too. And if anyone ever wants this, we created something called, we create a lot of GPTs. If anyone's familiar with GPTs, it's like an app for the app store, but for chat GPT. One of the GPTs we created, because we do stay in a lot of long-term rents, you know, one month to three months in locations, oftentimes we'll find it in Airbnb. And we've saved ourselves tens of thousands of dollars in Airbnb rentals through using this, uh, like this negotiation method style, whatever you want to call it. And we built it into a GP, into a chat GPT. So if anyone ever wants that, just send me over an email. I'll send that to you. It's it's pretty cool. You just plug in a bunch of information, like where you're staying, what you like about it, et cetera. We tell you what, what information we need, and then we'll uh, tell you what to say to the Airbnb host. 
And then if you even input how they responded, we'll give you some things that you can respond back to as well. Because you should be able to save on the low end 10% and on the high end 30 or more percent on your rentals uh, just by saying a couple of things. But always negotiate your rent on Airbnb, even if you're only staying for a week or so. You could save a ton of money from it. Yeah. Well, that's another thing I feel like is pivoting. I mean, we, we've tried and we've used them over the years and I don't know if it's maybe where we're staying. I would go up to big bear in the mountains and I mean, pain in the butt, uh, a lot of times and especially with our big family and, uh, the demands, you know, watch this video, learn about this. Here's how you operate the hot tub, turn this off, clean this place. I'm like, we're getting a hotel. <laughs> you know, right. It's like, cleaning fee and and a lot of times it's so misleading you know oh whatever hundred dollars a night whatever and three nights total 575 dollars you're like shouldn't it be 300 dollars? this fee that fee like, just tell me what the hell it's going to cost you know so are you seeing that industry change one thousand percent like with short terms if i'm a week le- week or less i'm usually doing a, doing a hotel because of a lot of what you just mentioned there um, and because Airbnb is like with a lot of industries, when it starts to do well, like even email, you know, for, per this conversation, opportunistic people join the market and they don't necessarily take the craft as seriously as maybe people used to take the craft. So that's one thing is luckily I've only had really two bad experiences with Airbnb, but that's also because I know pretty well how to vet these places because whether yeah. it's all of a sudden, you know, a hundred dollars a night turns into $200 a night from all the extra fees on top of it. Or they say it's going to look like this, and then it really looks like that. Or they say the location is here, but it's really over here. Uh, there's been bad experiences through Airbnb too. So a lot of times for short term stays, you know, a week or less, I-, I like to stay in hotels. They're easy, they're clean for the most part. Like you know what you're going to get with it. Where Airbnbs, it can be a little bit more of a variable. But for long term stays, especially because you know I want to have my own workspace, my business partner wants own workspace. You know, I love him, but I don't want to share the same bathroom as him. Like I want to have a big, you know, big enough, big enough place too, where like it feels like it's home. So that doesn't feel like you're just living out of a suitcase fully. Yeah. So in your EOC works, what, what are you doing? Are you coaching folks through this? Are you, are you like holding their hand? Uh, are you just doing it for them? Cause you're mentioning the tools you're mentioning instantly, uh, things like that. Are you, uh, do you just have like, a, a enterprise type level accounts and you're just doing it for them or, or do you go buy, do I buy the domain, set them up, make you an admin? Do I buy my own instantly? And then you're running it for me. Like, how does that work? Yeah. Great question. So there's two ways. Our bread and butter has always been people give us the keys. We just do it for them. So we do everything from the domain, creating the domains, the emails, warming up, getting lists, writing copies, sending emails, and booking a meeting on our customers' calendar. So that's our main way we work with our customers. All they need to do, need to do is show up to the meeting we book for them. However, uh, back in now July of 2023, we created our DIY. We know everyone's not an ideal fit for us. Some companies are a little earlier stage. Um, some people just want to do it on their own. So we have a DIY where we show people how to do it on their own. So we set up the initial sending infrastructure because we've seen that piece is really most difficult. It's not like it's that hard, but it's that thing that just nobody wants to do and people end up just not doing it. So we set up the domains, the emails, we get them hooked into, you know, that tool we call uh, that tool we use instantly. We show them how to send the emails. We write the copy for them. um, And then we basically oversee them from there on out. And we coach them. We have a bunch of videos they have access to live calls with us, et cetera. But the main way is we just do it for them, but we do have an option where we'll show people how, to, how they could do this on their own and help coach them through that process as well. Yeah. Um, is there a minimum? Because it, I mean, it takes a while to set this up. It takes a while to warm up the emails. Um, if you're doing the copywriting, I got to imagine it takes a minute to understand their value proposition, uh, dial in the messaging. So, you know, do they need to stick with you 60 or 90 days to start getting results? Yeah, we just have month to month. So you can opt out if you wanted to right away. Uh, But of course, like with any marketing, I always tell people like budging in at least three to six months. If you're not going to budget that in, you're not really giving this medium a chance to fully work for you because results ramp up over time. Follow-ups take time. uh, Getting the health of your domains and inboxes take time. 
So I always recommend to people that are doing cold outreach, either with us or on their own, you got to give it at least three to six months to really give it a full chance of working for you. But no, for us, we, we believe in what we do. And if someone wants to leave us right away, they can. Um, but luckily, that it's very rare that that happens. And so how are you growing this business? Are you relying just on cold email or are you starting to advertise and, and you know, multimedia, multi-step kind of be everywhere approach? I wouldn't say we're doing a be everywhere approach. We like to stick with what we're good at. Eventually, like I, if you could do everything, that's great. Um, but, you know, we're a small team. We got nine people at this point working with us. So we like to be pretty focused on what works well. Over half of our customers have come from us just doing cold email on our own. We're starting to see good results, though, from LinkedIn outreach, too. So that's been an interesting medium for us. We're testing out some cold calling with us. If it works well, we'll roll it out to our customers. So far, it hasn't been encouraging enough to do that. Um, and then the other main way we get our customers is through referrals. So that's a nice piece of uh, when, when you can get referrals. Obviously, that's always the best case. But in order to do that, you have to deliver for your customers. So cold email and cold LinkedIn is our primary way. Um, but we do get a, a good amount of customers from referrals and even just from relationships in this space too, from people that we know, people that know us on LinkedIn that'll come to us. How do you set the proper expectations with your customers? Cause I mean, obviously you don't want them to leave in a month. Um, but a lot of people are, are impatient. You know, I, I tell, I tell salespeople, your number one job is to disqualify. You know, you got to make sure they're not desperate or needy or pushy or have unrealistic expectations uh, that they have some staying power, you know, that they can go at least 90 days because this is going to take a minute. Uh, you know, how do you handle that? Love it. Under promise, over deliver. Like that's a big, uh, a big thing that, that we try to do. And for me, because I'm, I'm really like the point person, I'm taking the sales calls to start. So I'm just trying to under promise and over deliver for them. That's my goal. Um, and sometimes we've even seen too, the worse results you get in the, be the, the beginning, sometimes the better the customer is. We've had some customers, we had insanely good first, second, third months, and then they don't become a long-term customer versus our best customer to date. I say a best just because they've made the most money from us. And they've been with us now for almost two years is they made over a million dollars from our uh, our leads we've got from them. And they're a small shop, they're a web development shop, but the first few months with them were terrible. It was a uh, first month was super spammy, didn't go well, but I give their founders a ton of credit. They were patient, they believed in us, and now they're reaping the benefits of it. Even one of our newer customers, they've been with us at this point for probably six or seven months. First month was not good at all. I don't even know if we got them a single meeting, but he was like, I believe in you guys, I'm trusting you in the process. And they just, they closed, well, not they just, two months ago, they closed their first $100,000 deal. They have another big deal that they should be closing soon now too. Um, but their first month, first two months really weren't good either. So it's about setting a realistic expectation and hopefully you can uh, you know run through the wall with it. But I just feel like a lot of people in my world and probably most worlds, they overpromise. They sell a big dream. They tell you they're going to get you 40 leads a day. It's like, that's a load of crap. You know, you're not to try to lock in that contract, to try to get someone into a six-month, 12-month contract, and they don't deliver on it, but hey, they already got paid. For us, we do month-to-month. -month. We want to reduce friction. We try to under-promise, um, under and we do our best to over-deliver because if we can stay in that lane, we're going to have a lot of happy long-term customers. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but people get desperate. They say stupid stuff. I mean, it, so, you know, that's cool. Uh, I mean, I love your website. I mean, it's clean. Are you something I find appealing being going at this for decades. Um, you know, people think, Oh, inbound, inbound, uh, organic SEO, uh, social media. And they, like, it's free. Like nothing's free. You know, the time it takes to create a post takes time and expertise, uh, to engage in social media. I just saw a thing. It was a young, was a young girl who was just overwhelmed with being a content creator. She was like super successful. I think on TikTok, And she's like, I'm burned out. Like I'm under this pressure. The bigger I've gotten, you know, it's like more people like I'm on this schedule. Cause you think, Oh, it'd be great to be an influencer. Like, uh, no, I don't, you know, I leave, I leave the house 1130, go to jujitsu, <laughs> get back about two. Uh, I, I don't want to be that much in demand. 
Uh, you know, now I just moved my website and I'm going through and I find an old post, you know, how to do SEO in 2020. Like, well, shit, that's old. Uh, nobody wants to read that, you know, so you got to update stuff. Um, so uh, this direct approach, are you finding like, does it give you this time to travel the world and live in Hawaii and go to Italy and did you find a formula that works? Stick with it. You don't have to do all the ancillary stuff. Yeah, the key is building out a good system so that it can work for you. And the beginning of it was a big headache. Like I was manually responding to every email. I was building every single template. I was following up. I was doing all that stuff. But you have to do that at first so that you can build sure. the system so someone else can do it. Now, like I'm basically a customer in my own company. I get meetings booked on my calendar. I get the thread so I know what the context was. I see the person's LinkedIn, all that stuff. And then I just show up to the meeting. And then I can do what you know I like to do. And then also I can focus on other parts of the business that are higher value, but you have to build the system first. And to your point, Wes, too, it's like not everybody wants to be on Instagram, you know, holding their phone in front of them all day, trying to come up with new content. And also, is that the healthiest way to go through stuff? Like, sure. Does it suck when every once in a while you get an email from somebody who tells you to F off from a cold email? Sure. That doesn't feel good. <laughs> but look, if you're an influencer and you have a real following, you're going to get a ton of people that are just dragging you through the mud on social media. And I don't think that's the healthiest place to be. Like I tend to find my best days, the days I spend the least amount of time on my social media. And if you're an influencer, a lot of times you have to, like, I feel for athletes today. I feel for just, just celebrities in general today that have a big following where yes, you have people that are telling you how amazing you are and you have all this, you know, it's great, of course, to have a following in some ways, but it also kind of sucks when you have people that are saying some of the worst stuff in the world to you through social media. Like even when I did Facebook ads for one of my real estate developments, I had a guy tell me, cause you know, I would shoot a lot of videos of me like on the property. I had a guy comment, like, I hope you get COVID and die on my <laughs> Facebook post. And then I just started messaging with him and just, you know, trying to be nice to the guy. And then finally he messaged me back after a couple of messages. He's like, Hey man, look, I'm sorry. I was just having a bad day. You know, you seem like a good guy. If you ever want to grab a beer, let me know. And, um, but like on social media, it's full of that crap. You go into any comment sections full of that. So, you mm -hmm. know, yes, we all want to be social media influencers, you know, all in quotes, obviously not everyone does, but there's a dark <laughs> side to that too. Just like any type of marketing that, that ain't always pretty. So in your outreach to me, it it came from you, right? Um, versus you know an assistant. Um, why do you choose that approach? Well, first, if you have a good title, it tends to be better. Like if you're a CEO or founder, it tends to be better. If you have a good headshot, it tends to be better. We actually just, we have a, an AI cold email newsletter, and part of the newsletter we talked about how actually if it comes from a woman, it tends to get a higher response rate. So like going into your question though, Wes, like why do I do it for me versus an assistant? Uh, we've just seen it gets better results. You know, like if it comes from you, Wes, it's going to have a more, more of a credibility than if it comes from your assistant, who's not going to be as well known as you are. So it, I always find it better to come from the person you're reaching out to. Like one of our best customers, they're a big unicorn startup. The outreach that it's coming from is their CMO, their chief marketing officer, who's a, you know, a big time CMO. He doesn't mind his name, his name being out there. And he's the point person that we send the emails from. We don't book the meetings for him, but we're sending it from him. And it gets a really good response because if you look this guy up, it's like, oh crap, this is a big time guy. He's very successful. He has a great pedigree. So some of our follow-ups will come from, you know, our assistant. A lot of, some of my follow-ups will come from my assistant and then, then we'll talk, we'll put his name in there. But the main outreach, I always think it's better to come from the point person. So how, how did that work? So I, I'm looking at the emails you sent me and they came from your primary domain. Um, but I, I see the, in the small print underneath, you know, there is an unsubscribe button. So it was a, it was a blast email. Um, how do you decide, you know, when to use a burner domain versus a real one? Yeah. Great question. So that is, that does come from my main email. Uh, not sorry, not my main email, but it comes from my main domain. Right. The reason we do that is because the domain is very healthy. That email is very healthy and it's a very curated list. Like that was not a big mass blast list. It's highly curated and it gets a great response from it. Um, so there's like no spam concerns and it's a very, again, curated list. So 
I know I say do ne- never e- cold email on your main domain. And I did do that when it comes to even reaching out to US. But again, it's a very curated list with very good response and very good positive response. So it's we have no worries of that being a spam, a spammy type of email that's going to affect our main domain's health or even that domain's health. Sorry, that email's health. Yeah. But you probably also saw all of my heart emojis, right, on all of my videos. So you knew I was like this little teddy bear that, that would accept your email. Yeah, I, I knew next to Wes in the notes section, it was he's uh <laughs> he's a he's a big teddy bear, great guy. He's gonna love this email. So uh and you know, just for our listeners, right? It's like you messaged me and and like I said, I I I hate email. I mean I'm I'm on it. I help people do it, but um, I miss emails and, uh, you had to send a couple, uh, and I was like, oh shit, man, I missed it. You know? So it's like, I wasn't ignoring you. I wasn't like, oh, here's another spam. Oh, here's another pill, uh, another pitch. Yeah, I do get that. But I mean, it was from you. It was real. Uh, and I was just busy. So, I mean, it took a few emails to get my attention. So what are you finding? Like, what's the norm? If, if somebody just sticks with cold email, um, you know, is it three touches? Is it seven? Like, where are you seeing is a sweet spot where people are, are getting back to them? First, there's no perfect number. Like, this is, yeah, this is not average, hyper- seeing a blend. Yeah. Yeah. So on average, because we track for every single meeting we've, we've scheduled, we track how many we have a big spreadsheet, how many emails it takes. On average, it's about three and a half emails to get one meeting booked. So that's the average. We'll typically do a nine point sequence. So one email and eight follow-up emails. We've had people on that eighth follow-up email turn into a customer. We've had people on that eighth follow-up email tell me to F off and I'm the worst person in the world. So like, again, you just don't, don't, if you get one bad response, don't be thrown off that person really just could have woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Maybe their yeah. husband just got mad at them. Their wife just got mad at them. Their kids are sick. Like you don't know what's going on. Just do your best to, if somebody responds, you don't keep reaching out to them. And also you send them something that can and should be relevant to them. Like Wes, if I reached out to you and was like, Hey, my name is Adam and I'm a scientist and I'm looking at a cure for this virus. Do you want to chat or should I be on a podcast? You'd be like, Hey, this is so irrelevant to me. What are you doing here? But I reached out to you because I knew you had a sales podcast and you had a good following. So I knew you had a good podcast and I've been on a lot of podcasts similar to this one. Would you be interested in having me as a guest or having a conversation about me being a guest? So it needs to be relevant. Like some people get so lazy with it and it's like, I know this is so irrelevant to me. That's what will annoy people. But typically if it's relevant to that person, and it's framed in a way where it's simple, it's clear, it's easy to understand, and there's an easy way to opt out. Most people are more than forgiving on it. It's the the rare, you know, one percent of them that are gonna come back and just want to take something out on somebody else. Hmm. I mean, do power people, right? C level executives, do they want to attend a webinar, or do they want to? seven point checklist on this, that, and the other, or do they want a 15 minute zoom meeting and just cut to the chase? Yeah, exactly. Like some people are just trying to sell a white paper. Like for me, it's very simple. The way we structure our emails and we created a, you know, a GPT for people so they can rewrite their emails in our best email styles. But the same way, it's really simple. It's what's the purpose of the email? One sentence. What's the problem you solve? One sentence. What's your solution? About one sentence. What's your social proof? About one sentence. And then what's your call to action? Hey, do you have 15 minutes to chat about this? But a lot of times people I'll see will sell like reading this white paper or taking this extra step. And it's like, if you can't describe your value in a short, sweet email, then you got to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I think people over they overdo like everything and people always they're messaging me hey you want to hop on a zoom call no i don't like send me a summary you know hell i get irritated i had a guy last week you know we're on facebook he he's got a pitch and he sends me two voice memos it took me five days to go open those voice memos you know i could have read the text immediately um 
So it's like, oh, it's convenient for him to send the voice memo. It's not convenient for me to listen to it. You know, so they they overdo things, and I think I think most like most salespeople, business owners, whatever, they don't understand the value they bring. I think they they keep the prospect uh, too lofty. You know, like an ivory tower, like they're this lowly servant below them. Please, just I know, I know you're really busy. If you can just carve out a few minutes, like. Do not say that, right? So, but decision makers, you know, hard chargers can make big decisions fast. Fast, you know, and usually they make them they make them fast or not at all, you know. Uh, and in the big scheme of things, like you mentioned, Mark Cuban or whatever, you know, like for the average person listening to this, for them to make a million dollar sale to Mark Cuban, that might be their biggest deal of their lives, you know. But for Mark Cuban. It's a rounding error. You know, it's like, should I buy the new 80 inch TV, you know, for my living room? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But he's not losing sleep over that. So, you know, we got to understand who we're talking to and uh, I cut to the chase. So, yeah, detail. One of my I, favorite things to talk about with, because I feel like entrepreneurs do this and salespeople, those are probably the two worst people when it comes to this, is they're just over, over, over. Over talk, over share, overdo everything. Where I always like to share details, create confusion, and a confused buyer is never a buyer. If you confuse someone, they're not going to buy, especially when it comes to the higher ups, the people that are the most busy. They'll give you a chance, but they're going to skim through it. Just like when someone skims through a resume, they're doing a quick skim, maybe giving it a few seconds. And then if they're interested, they'll keep looking. If not, they're moving on. You know, so you got to get to the point. And also to your point also about like people can make decisions. I hear so many salespeople and entrepreneurs probably especially because most entrepreneurs I found are are at least a lot of the ones I work with are great with product, great with ideas, not always great in the sales side. I think it's a big gap with the entrepreneur world is not great with sales. And uh, that's why I think people like us are so important because if you don't sell, you got nothing. Um, And one of the biggest gaps I see is sales cycles. People overestimate sales cycles so much. Like my offering is not super expensive. You know, the average deal size is right around $50,000 a year. It's the average deal size. So it's not huge, but it's also not tiny. Out of our cold email customers alone, just looking at those, because those are the opposite of warm leads. Most people see a meeting that comes from a cold email. That's a low quality lead. I've seen the opposite though. We've had, uh, I think as of today, it's either 32 or 33, forgive me for you know being off by one or two here, 32 or 33 cold email customers that just come from cold email outreach. Out of those alone, 12 32 or 33 what? bought within 24 hours, uh, customers from cold email outreach. Oh, you've gotten that many so customers. Of, yeah. Out of our, uh, out of our customer base you know, which is over 60 full service customers, about 32 or 33 of them have come from cold email alone. On those, 12 oh, I got of those, you. There was a little, so about a, a little third, there. a little bit over a third. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, a, about over a third of them bought within 24 hours of that conversation, that first conversation. Oh, Bought wow. either they paid the setup fee or signed the agreement. Well over half, I think it's 17 or 18 at this point, uh, whatever the latest date is bought within one week. And again, I don't have the biggest product. Like I'm not, it's not the largest ACV, but it's also not a baby either. So, you know, a lot of these times with sales cycles, if you talk to the right person at the right time and they trust you, they don't want to wait. They don't want to talk to 30 other vendors. They don't want to keep sitting on this problem. If you have something in need, you talk to the right person at the right time, you make it easy for them to buy, you remove the friction. People can and should buy quickly. When I buy, when I want like something, I'll buy quickly. If I don't, if I don't feel like it's a need, I'll push it off to the side. But usually, if I want to buy something, I'll buy it. So, would you say out of these that bought quickly, were they already considering something like this, or did they just see the value? You know, or were other things kind of failing, and they're like, "All right, like it's a low risk, right? It's affordable, month to month. Okay, let's get started." I mean. What's going on there? 
It's a great question. I don't know the data to it. I just haven't didn't do like a survey with them to ask them specifically that question. Now, if I were to guess, I would say right. almost all, if not all, they had a big need. They maybe have tried a solution like this in the past. They already had the budget ready. So they were ready to buy, which again, not everybody's ready to buy. If I talk to 10 people and one or two of them fit that and are ready to buy as long as you present them with a good solution, I'm signing up for that all day long. You know, you might have to go through five people that are just unqualified, three people that might be a fit in the future. And then there might be one or two out of 10 that are like, hey, if you could do this in the right way, if it fits their budget, if you make it easy for them, they build the trust, they're ready to buy right away. I would imagine that's where the people that bought for me, that bought quickly, they I would imagine checked off all those boxes. I'm not going to be naive and say, hey, I converted somebody who's a non-believer into a believer in a 30-minute call. I'm sure they were already a relative believer and then believed in what we offer. And that's why they were able to move fast. But so many of us have more of those conversations than we realize. Like I'll see some sales calls because some of our customers will record their sales meetings and send it to me. And sometimes my stomach will turn because mm. I'm like, oh, dude, yes. why are you asking this? Why are you bringing two people to your first call? You're the CEO. Like, what do you, why, why are you asking those questions? Why are you talking like that? I know how you talk in real life. And then all of a sudden, when you get in the sales call, kind of to your point, Wes, it's like you're talking like you're like talking to your mother or father when you're seven years old. It's like, no, be yeah. confident in who you are and just be who you are. Because if you're yeah. trying to talk up to them like they're this God because they have the money and they're trying to buy your stuff, it's not going to work because they're also not going to trust you. And if you don't mm-hmm. have trust, you don't have a sale as everybody listening to this podcast uh, already knows well and good. Yeah. Well, and I got to imagine too, people that are booking these appointments, if it's the right list, they're not looky loose. I mean, they're not just wanting a free education. You know, they're like, what the hell is this? Um, and so it should be a qualified appointment, you know, person booking that call. So, so that makes sense. Um, and, and what what are your calls like? Are you going through a formal deck? Are you just showing the software, the dashboard? Or are you just answering their questions? I mean, are, is it a pretty quick call? Yeah, it's, it's quick and simple. And usually I, the meetings are typically scheduled for 30 minutes. Rarely do they go over. I've also found when calls go too long, they for whatever reason, they don't tend to be the best buyers. But my call flow yeah. is very simple. Like in the beginning, I just say, hey, basically, let's, Thanks for taking the time. Let's dive right into it. I'll share a little bit about myself. So I'll give maybe like a 60 to 90 second story about myself and the company and what we do. Then they might have some questions or they'll share some more stuff. And then it's just a free flowing conversation. I know the certain things that I need to understand from that call to even know if they could be a good customer for us. But those are you know three to five things that I don't need to pepper them like it's an interview. It just mm-hmm. becomes a conversation. And because it's a conversation, they'll also often tell me things that maybe they wouldn't normally tell me if the situation was more of like, hey, I have these 10 questions I need to ask you before you know we get into anything. I yeah. always show the pricing on the call. I always do a quick run through of it. I don't, throw a, I don't show a deck. It's just a one pager with the pricing. I always want to talk about it on the first call because, hey, if it's too much, like why waste, continue to waste time on it? And I'd rather go through the pricing together so that we can address any questions you have, address any concerns you have, go through it, because people are going to forget a lot of the details anyway. Oh, yeah. So I would rather address it head on. Um, and that's typically the way I do it. I typically actually don't even follow up a ton after calls. So I'm not really trying not to chase people. Like I, I, let to, I like to try to let buyers buy. And if you're that, great. If you're not that, you know, that's okay. I, my, my pipeline, I'm always trying to do my best to make sure it's full. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you can have some drip, you know, maybe automate it, maybe. A, For sure. Hey, how you doing? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm the same way. It's like, it's either easy and obvious, you know, and it's a hell yeah, or it's a hell no. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Exactly. Yeah. I'll and do how old right. are you? So how for do you sure. Know all this, man. How do you know all this? You're young. I'm uh yeah, I'm 30, <laughs> 32. I'll be uh I'll be 33 coming up soon. Um, I mean, the, I always tell people like I did a, a one year MBA, but it's only because they had me continue working for the school as I was running the entrepreneur program that I started. So I got, I was paid to do my one year MBA at the, at the college and I never worked a real, you know, quote unquote, real job. I just started my first company and, uh, I, it was the best PhD that I could ever buy. Like it was, uh, it was not a big money maker as I shared a little bit earlier. 
It was me constantly banging my head against the world wall, but I was blessed to have great investors. You know, our main investor in that company still works with us today as a, he's a great customer um, and has been amazing as a mentor. So I, I'm, I'm blessed to have a great business partner, um, great investors in the past, uh, great mentors working with me and uh, yeah, just great people around me. But there's, I always say like when I think back to some of the conversation I used to have or when I was starting that first company as a 22 year old, bright eyed, bushy tailed entrepreneur, my stomach like turns at some of the stuff I used to say you know, billionaire mm. bust and all that stuff. And I'm hoping at 35, my stomach will turn from something I said in this podcast today. So, uh, so there, there's a lot to learn and, and uh, I'm excited for it. Nah, man, you're doing, you're doing things right. I'm 20 years ahead of you and I can find no fault in what you're doing, man. <laughs> so just do more of it. I appreciate it, man. And people like That's you badass. genuinely are, are what uh, inspire me because there's, there's not a lot of people like you that are, that are doing what you're doing. And um, we're obviously not meeting in person here, but they like the ability to even communicate like this. And it came from a cold email, you know, like I've met some, some good friends have come from cold emails. And uh, when this digital world that we're in now, of course, it'd be best if we could be hanging out and, you know, seeing each other face to face in person. But the fact that we can communicate here from two different parts of the world is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Hell man, I'm friends with some dudes. I mean, we met by punching each other in the face. <laughs> I'm 20 years older. So we used to meet more in person and get yeah. mad at each other. You know? there you go. <laughs> now we just block each other on social media. We don't have to deal with them. Exactly. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe, maybe again, punch in the face is a better way to learn. I think. Hey, it, <laughs> pain, pain is real, right? People can talk about, you know, what is a woman? Well, I don't know. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a whatever, you know, but pain is real. <laughs> you know, if you're in pain, it's like, I need to fake whatever I'm doing is wrong because that sure does hurt. So, you know, it, it is, it's a good, it's a good teacher. But uh, I digress. avoiding, uh, I think, uh, I think today, too many of us, and sometimes, you know, I'm unfortunately probably including this too, avoid pain. And it's the best yeah. learning we can have. Like, I remember even my, I think it was my freshman year of high school, it was my freshman year of high school. I was, I was playing basketball. I wasn't getting the playing time I wanted. And I was talking to my father about it. And he's like, go to the coach and don't say, I want more playing time. Say, what can I do to earn more playing time? What can yeah. I work on to deserve to play more? And how do we not avoid this and say, hey, my coach is a jerk because he won't play me or she won't play me? Or how do we say, oh, it's just not fair or quit? It's like, no, if something isn't where you want it to be, whether it's your fitness, start eating better, work out more. If you're not where you want to be with your job, work harder, find mentors, do the little things. Like if you want to accomplish anything in life, it's going to take getting calluses and feeling pain. And um, I need to, I need to avoid it less too. So, uh, uh, but it's, it's a, I, I need to do jujitsu because uh, I probably need a little toughen up in that area too. Jujitsu is always the answer. You know, a, a cold plunge is sometimes the answer. Uh, running, uh, sometimes the answer. Jujitsu is always the answer. So I, I agree with that one, man. So, uh, all right. So where do people go? EOCworks.com? Is that where you want to go? Yeah, EOCworks.com is uh, my website. Social media, I'm most active on Instagram and also LinkedIn and just at Adam I. Rosen. And then my email, if anyone wants to email me directly, it's adam at eocworks.com. So if you do want our GPT prompt, whether it's you're going into an Airbnb and you want to negotiate some rent, if you want a GPT for our cold emailing, just shoot me over an email and I'll make sure that gets sent to you. Uh, all right. So I'm adding that here to the notes. Very cool. Well, it's uh, well, I'm going to the gym, but for you, it's only what is it noon there? You're three hours behind right now. Uh, two hours behind right now, so it's one p.m. my time. Two hours. Behind. One. Okay, cool. What's well, lunchtime, man? Well, Adam, thanks for a spam. I mean, I mean, I mean, cold emailing me. I mean, being professional enough to do professional outreach, man. So it's been good catching up. No, thank you. It was a pleasure <laughs> meeting you. I, I I appreciate you and, and everything you do, and for having me on here. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, man, it's been good. All right, dude. Have a good day. Cool. Thanks, Wes. Talk soon. He is confident in what he's doing. And hey, you need to be the first person that is sold on what you do. 
uh, and he is. And, you know, he's got some good points. I was asking him about, you know, is this just spam, right? Uh, and he says, look, nobody likes to see bad anything. Bad ads suck. So I think it was Ogilvy, you know, said people don't read what interests them. Uh, or people don't read an ad. They read what interests them. Sometimes it's an ad. So uh, if you've got a better offer, um, if you can write a good offer, a compelling offer, uh, if you have a good reason for interrupting your prospect, then knock yourself out. Give this a try. Okay. Reach out to Adam. Uh, you great. Reach out to me. Um, I know how to do this stuff. I'm doing it for helping two clients run it. Uh, and my buddy uh, is doing it for himself. Um, and he's offering it to others. I help on the copywriting side, uh, help with a compelling message. Um, Roger helps all the technical setup behind the scenes. <laughs> There's quite a few moving uh, you know, pieces and parts. So um, it's a lot of it, honestly, is tedious. Uh, but once it's set up, you, know, you can kind of, you know, fire and forget. Set it up, let it run. So if that interests you, let me know. Uh, if you want to join the inner circle, it is westmethod.com. Just j- click that and read the worst sales page ever. All right. Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something. <laughs>